Aloha. So good to see you all here this morning as we worship our Father in heaven. I want to say thank you to all of our visitors, so many of you this morning. Thank you for being an encouragement to our congregation. Uh, we get visitors almost every Sunday from different parts of the world, and I know a lot of you are members of the Lord's family, and it's encouraging that uh, you decided not to go on vacation uh, on the first day of the week, uh, but to join your family here in ha Hawaii uh, to worship our Father in heaven. So we are very encouraged by your presence uh, this morning. Aloha to our church family. It's always good to see your beautiful faces. And, and those of you also who are on Zoom, I cannot see you right now, but I know you are tuning in, worshiping God with us as you can. Today's lesson is uh, part of the series of lessons that I've been preaching based on my visit uh, to Israel. Uh, for those who do not know, uh, last year in November, uh, myself, one of our elders uh, and his wife and one of the members, we were blessed to be able to go to Israel and to walk where Jesus walked and to get to see the places that we read about in the Bible. And this trip has been a, a great blessing in my ministry and and um, I wanted to share with everyone and I know a lot of you uh, you share with me how you enjoy uh, going with me on this trip through these lessons um, and there are a lot of lessons still to come we we looked at a lot of them and so today I want to welcome you to Dan right and when we were in uh, Israel on uh, I think it was day two of the tour, uh, we were blessed to go up north uh, where it's nice and green, not so much desert in this area, uh, where the temperature is cooler. And that water you're seeing is the Dan River. It's one of the main sources to the Jordan River. So uh, I preached this uh, lesson on the Jordan River, and I mentioned to you that there are several rivers from the base of Mount Hermon that feed the Jordan River. And this is one of them. And as you stand by this flow of water, you can feel the temperature is cold, All right. So if you like swimming in cold water, you might be tempted to jump in for a swim here. Dan is the name of the place, uh, but we know in the scripture, Dan is the name of the fifth son of, of uh, Jacob, of Israel. Uh, it was his son uh, through Rachel's maid. And we know Rachel was barren, and Dan was one of the sons born to Ra Rachel uh, through the maid. Genesis 30 and verse 6 uh, is that reference there. Um, Dan, one of the places we visited here had several reconstructions. And this is one of them. And what a reconstruction is, is basically they're trying to rebuild uh, uh, the, the ancient ruins based on archaeological finds, based on research. They try to make it look like, you know, how it, how it looked back in the day because it's, it's all like nothing over there, right? If you're not into archaeology and you go on this trip and you see this, you might say well, it's just a pile of rocks, <laughs> right? But um, as you can see, uh, there's a reference here to the naming of this place. And that's found, at, that reference there on the sign is Joshua 19 and 47. Uh, there was a time I, I, I teased Lala um, when we were on the trip. I told Lala, let me show you my Hebrew reading skills, right? And and Lala didn't realize it yet, but the, the Hebrew is on top, but the English is on the bottom. And I was pointing to the Hebrew and reading it from the English. <laughs> and uh, uh, I really appreciate Lala. <laughs> uh, I tricked her in, in that one, but that was a, a funny moment on the trip. But the reference says this in Joshua 19 and verse 47. And the border of the children of Dan went beyond these, because the children of Dan went up to fight against Lisham and took it. And they struck it with the edge of the sword, took possession of it, 
and dwelt in it. And they called Lisham Dan after the name of their father, Dan. All right. And so a look on the map, right, to get ourselves oriented. Uh, Dan is the northernmost part of the kingdom of Israel. Now, there's a reference where the kingdom went beyond Dan. But many of the references to scripture would use a, a reference uh, or a description uh, that says this, from Dan to Beersheba, right? And that, at the very bottom of your screen right here, there's Beersheba, and all the way up north is Dan. And when they say from Dan to Beersheba, they meant all of Israel, all right? Because it covered all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba. Here's one of those references uh, in 1 Samuel 3 and verse 20. And all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as the prophet of the Lord. That's a, that's a great range, right, to be known as God's prophet, and so this reference appears some nine times um, in the Bible. Now, the most interesting place uh, to me, and this really gets into our lesson uh, during our visit in Dan, is right here in this area. And it may be hard for you to see it, but this is sort of like an altar. And um, I'd like for us to open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12. Because this gets into our lesson. And I want to read first. And then I'll explain the significance of this pile of rock. <laughs> right? A nice pile of rock, if you will. Uh, First Kings chapter 12. I want to begin reading from verse 25. To lay the context or the background of First Kings chapter 12. This is the time when the kingdom of Israel is about to be divided. All right. Remember that King Solomon, after his father, David, he became the king of all of Israel. But what we're about to read is the kingdom divided somewhere around 931 B.C. The kingdom of Israel was divided in two, ten tribes to the north and only two tribes to the south. Really only one because the tribe of Benjamin sort of like got dissolved into Judah. Right, so Judah mainly in the south and everyone else in the northern part. So let's let's read that here. And this is a, a reference to King Jeroboam and what he did when he became the king of the ten tribes. And the Bible says this. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built Benuel. And, Jer and Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people, a heart of this people, will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice. And made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you from uh, up from the land of Egypt. And he set one of them in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast of the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he, he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. He ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. Jeroboam 
received a vision from the prophet of God, Abijah, and he told him that God was going to give him the northern kingdom. But Jeroboam, when he became king, he, as we read from the text, he realized that most of the people would travel to observe the commanded feast. Where were they to worship God? In Jerusalem in the south. Right? Jerusalem in Judah was where the temple was. And the king, Jeroboam, realized that if they travel down to Jerusalem, they will turn back to God. They will turn back and follow uh, Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And so instead of doing what the Lord said, to heed the Lord's instruction, Jeroboam decided he's going to build two idols, two golden calves. He'll put one in Bethel, which Bethel was then the southernmost part of the northern kingdom, and he put one in Dan. And what you're looking at in this picture is the supposed location of where this altar was, right? Everything in the Bible lands there. You got to take it as a grain of salt. With a grain of salt, it might be the location. And a lot of people believe this is the exact location where this golden calf was erected. That brings me to the title of our lesson, The Power of Influence. The Power of Influence. And there are many stories in the Bible that we can go to that can teach us about influence. We can go to Abraham and his faith, how it influenced his sons and his sons after, uh, after him. We can go to Joshua and his influence, his courage in leading God's army and conquering the land. We can go to various characters, David, so on, so many characters. We can definitely learn a very important lesson about influence from Jeroboam, uh, from Jeroboam's account. Here's the truth about influence. One never loses his or her influence. Right? Sometimes we might hear that saying, that you lose your influence. You never really lose your influence. Another truth about influence, it can change. Your influence can be positive and change to negative. It can be negative, change to positive. So when some people say you lose your influence, basically you have a negative influence on that person. You no longer have a positive impact on that person's life. Or at the very least, your influence no longer matters to that person or in their life. Right? So you never lose your influence. Your influence can be good or bad. And so several thoughts about influence that we can learn from Jeroboam. Here's the first and one of the major points that we should think about. Disobedience to God leads to negative influence. This is always the case in scripture, in the various examples in scripture, that when a man or a woman disobeys God, there are negative uh, uh, consequences. And it impacts others as well. It influences others in a negative way. I want us to know that Jeroboam did have the opportunity to be a good influence. right? Because sometimes, uh, if we don't know the story of Jeroboam, all we hear about Jeroboam is the bad things he'd done. Setting up the two uh, calves in Dan and Bethel. Right? And the Bible repeats that a lot of times. We'll look at it. All right? But he did have an opportunity to change, to choose to have a positive influence. Let's look at it. In chapter 11 of 1 Kings, go there with me. 1 Kings chapter 11. And I'll read this again. Notice verse 31 through 40. 1 Kings chapter 11, 31 through 40. And the Bible says, And he said, that is Abijah, 
uh, the uh, Ahijah, not Abijah, Ahijah, the prophet of God speaking to Jeroboam, letting him know about God's decision for him. All right, listen to this. And he said to Jeroboam, take yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worship Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. And to his son I will give one tribe, that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart desires and you shall be king over Israel. Now listen to verse 38. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house. And as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon, therefore, sought to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt, to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. What a great opportunity that God has given to Jeroboam. He made him a promise. right? If you will heed my voice. If you keep my commandments, if you walk in my ways, I will build you a house like I did for David. When you hear the name of David, you talk about the power of influence. David was a great leader of God's people. He was the king of Israel. The king that they looked forward to coming. They thought there was going to be another David. But they got Messiah, Jesus. You think about the influence of David when he obeyed God. Stories or the accounts like David and Goliath. Right? It, it, God did not intend this to be the case, but it, it, it has become the case. The story of, of, of David and Goliath is one of the most uh, well-known reference in sports. <laughs> you talk about the power of influence. Right? Whenever a lower seed faces a top seed, they, they always bring it up. It's like a David and Goliath story. The power of influence. Think about when David sinned. Think about what he did to Uriah and, and the, the bad things, the bad choices he did. You talk about the power of influence. That affected the line after him. It affected his household. It affected his sons. His decision had, uh, had influence others around him. And so let, let's remember this important point. Disobedience to God leads to negative influence. Jeroboam had the opportunity to choose. But in, instead of choosing to be obedient to God, he chose to rebel and many others after his decision followed his way. Here's the number two thing about influence. You will be known by your influence. You will be known by your influence. Sometimes we hear uh, in a negative light, we might hear someone say, uh, he's trying or she's trying to make a name for themselves. Ever heard that before? Yeah, yeah. Right, But that's in a negative light. Usually we bring that up in a negative light. 
But there is a good sense where we are to strive for a good name, that we need to make a good name for ourselves, right? Proverbs 22 and verse 1, the Bible says that. Proverbs 22 and verse 1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. You will be known by your influence. I want to demonstrate that with Jeroboam here. Jeroboam's name is forever stained. He's, he's been long dead, but here we are reading and mentioning his name. His name is forever stained by his negative influence. All right. Let's notice the kings that followed after him. All right. Notice this. Kings, uh, 1 Kings 15, verse 32 through um, 34. In the third year of, of Asa, king of Judah, down in the south, and Basha, the son of Ahijah, uh, became king over Israel in the north and reigned 24 years. What did he do? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Notice this. And walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin, by which he made Israel sin. That's one of the references. All right? We're not going to cover all of them, but we'll cover a majority. Right? This king arose after the first king of the north of, 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 of Israel, followed Jeroboam, walked in the way of Jeroboam. Right. So, so this description describes a certain way. What is the way of Jeroboam? Worshiping idols. Worshiping idols. You talk about power of influence. Have you, have you ever heard someone say, that's my idol? LeBron James. That's my idol. All right. Um, and it's, it's, it's important to have, you know, uh, people in your lives, positive influence in your life. Right. Uh, but notice here, it's like these individuals are saying, Jeroboam. That's our idol. You know, that, that's our model. Here's the other one. All right. First Kings 16, verse 26 and verse 25. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him. For he walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. And in his sin, by which he made Israel sin, provoking the Lord of Israel to, to uh, Lord God, Lord God of Israel, with their idols. What is the way of Jeroboam, worshiping in idols? When he set up in Dan the golden calf, and in Bethel the second golden calf, it, it affected the entire northern kingdom. It influenced everyone that followed as a leader. Even some who had some bright, uh, positive moments like Jehu still fall at this sin of Jeroboam. Here's another one. 1 Kings 16, verse 30 and 31. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of who? Jeroboam. To walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took a wife, Jezebel, the daughter of, of, of Ethbal, uh, king of Zidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. You talk about names and reputation. There's another one, Jezebel. All right. Ahiza, here's another one. Son of Ahab, became king over Israel in Samaria, the northern kingdom. And in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walk in the way of his fathers and the way of his mother. And it doesn't stop there. And in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. Here's another one. Second Kings 1 and verse 3. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother.
for he put away the secret uh, sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in what? In the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who had made Israel sin, he did not depart from them. We're talking years, years of generational influence. Here's the last one for the sake of our time. There's actually a lot of it. Here's the last one. All right. 2 Kings 13, verse 1 and verse 2. In the third year of Joash, the son of, of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who had made Israel sin and did not depart from them. I was standing there at this altar in Dan. I was thinking this about this text. I was like, wow. This is where generations of God's people left the Lord because of this decision by Jeroboam not to obey God and his influence impact generations. Now we know the story of the Northern Kingdom. There is not one righteous king that arose there was not, I should say, that arose in the northern kingdom. Not one. And the northern kingdom was the first to be destroyed and carried away captive. 721, 722 BC, however you look at it, they were destroyed by the Assyrians. And you can trace their demise to one man, Jeroboam. Talk about the power of influence. Let's say God is still writing the Bible. Let's just say that right now. Um, we're not going to go off here and say something, God. Is not, but let's, let's say that's the case today, that we're living in a time, and let's say the scriptures are still being written, and one day it will be printed out and will be available like this book. And you and I are part of the story of the Bible. What would God say of us? What would be the way of Lima? What would that be like? You know, because the way of Jeroboam, his influence would lead people away from God. What would be my way? What would be your way? Are you thinking about your influence hundreds of years from now? You ever thought about that? Your influence, maybe 30 years from now. All right. And a decision that you make today can impact the people around you for generations to come. Have you thought about that? And so, if God was to write an account about our influence, what would be the way of so and so? You will be known by your influence, good or bad. So the last thought this morning is God cares about your influence. He really does. The fact we have a story like Jeroboam's and the fact that the Bible, the Holy Spirit used some ink and some spaces in the Holy Word of God to fill it with the sins of Jeroboam tells us that he cares about influence. Tells us that what Jeroboam did was important to God. It impacted the kingdom of the north. And that brings us to the scripture that was read for us today. No one has a greater influence in the history of the world than Jesus. When I think of the name of Jesus, I think about the sacrificial lamb of God offered on an altar that God chose 
on the cross that he may redeem mankind. In uh, 2020, one of my favorite athletes died by a helicop helicopter accident. You probably know who I'm talking about. Kobe Bryant. I have never met Kobe Bryant in my life. Never shook his hand. <laughs> he doesn't even know Lima. <laughs> right? A lot of us who like celebrities, they don't even know our names. <laughs> God knows our name. Right? When Kobe died, I mean, it was the strangest thing. Let me tell you, I was crying. I was sitting in my office crying. It, it felt like I knew the man. I felt like I knew Kobe. Right? I felt like I had a relationship with him. That's the power of influence. Kobe. No one would work harder than Kobe Bryant when it came to basketball. Right? He's at the gym before everyone is at the gym. There's a mentality called the Black Mamba mentality. That's, that's the mentality of never giving up, never being mediocrity, always working hard, striving. Kobe Bryant. <laughs> when I was at college, I had a, a, a 2001 a Chevy Blazer. It was black. Put some 20-inch rims on it, drop it down, put some loud speakers in it, blast my music when I was in college. Guess what I named that blazer? Black Mamba. The power of influence. But Kobe didn't die for me. And when I think of Jesus bearing the cross, despising the shame, Owning my worthless name. It changes you. When you think about the power of Jesus, it changes you. It changes you to be good. And he wants us to have that impact in the world around us. To be a good Influence. Notice what he said. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, where would it be salted? Or how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of man. Salt has some positive things about it. It preserves things, right? Those of you who, who grew up without an icebox, maybe you're, you're still alive today, right? <laughs> you grew up without an icebox. You know that, that one of the ways that people, and I know this is true in the Philippines, in Samoa, in several islands where, where, where people can't afford a refrigerator, the way you keep something fresh a long time, salt, right? It preserves it, keeps it fresh. But salt also makes things good, right? You don't grill steak without seasoning, right? If if you do that, uh, if you do that, uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, we can't be friends. Uh, you got to put season on your steak. It makes meat taste good. It makes food taste good, or any food. You can add a little bit of salt to it, right? It can't be too much. Don't don't overdo it. But it has a positive impact on food. But salt also makes you thirsty. I've said it to the church here before. You eat a lot of sunflower seeds. What happens? You get thirsty. Salt makes you thirsty. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. You are to preserve the, the world. You preserve the family. You preserve the community. You preserve your country. 
you make it good as well. The Christian, you have a positive influence in your how, in your house, in your relationships, in your communities. You should as Christians. But also as a Christian, when someone looks at you, they are the thirst for Christ. I want what she has, what he has. They have something about them that I don't have. That's Jesus. We have Jesus. Then he also said, you are the light of the world. All right. Who likes to work in the dark? <laughs> All right. Light is positive. You are a light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. It's true today. If you're out on the water, and I, I go out kayak fishing a lot. If you're out on the water and it's dark in the morning, sometimes I'm crazy enough to go out that time. I'm thankful for light because I know land is right there. <laughs> right where the light is, that's where land is. Right when it's pitch black out there. That's what Jesus is saying. When, you light, when there's a light on a hill, it will be seen. When a Christian is at work, when a Christian is out, out and about in the community, they will be seen. Your influence will be felt and be noticed. Jesus said, men do not light a lamp and hide it or put it under a basket, but they hold it up so that the world can see it, so that all who can be can see the light can be drawn to God. And so he said, let your light, this is your influence, Yet your, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, right? Christians, we, we, we cannot be like the monks to hide and do good hiding. We should be seen doing good. Because it brings glory to the Father. Yes, there is a balance, right? There's doing something to be seen. There's a difference for, uh, between doing something to be seen and seeing doing good, being, uh, doing something good. We should be the latter. Let your light will shine before men. Let me glorify your Father who is in heaven. How is your influence? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is there a decision that you need to make today that will impact generations after you, that will impact others after you? Whatever that decision may be, I encourage you, make that decision today. Uh, positive influence starts with becoming a child of God. And if you are not yet a child of God, hear the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You need to listen to what the Bible says about Jesus. You need to believe he is the Son of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You need to repent of all your sins. In other words, give up sin. Turn away from sin. Turn to God. Jesus said, except you repent, you will likewise perish. You need to confess Jesus is the Son of God. Romans 10, 10 tells us that with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you make that great confession, be baptized. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes not will be condemned. Mark 16 and verse 16. And then live your life for Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live that I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you need to make a decision this morning, we welcome you. Come forward as we stand and sing a song of encouragement. <laughs>